if faith is connection to inner strength, to bigger picture of life, to one another, despair is the sundering of connection. Mm. And it would be the opposite. And you talked about despair a little bit earlier. And in light of your journey, where you said grace was there too. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman, and I'm the longtime producer of this podcast, and happy to be bringing you today's 208th episode of the Meta Hour. And this conversation today is part of our real life series we're doing, all centered around the themes from Sharon's new book by the same name, Real Life. And today is actually an interview that was part of the Living an Authentic Life Summit, which happened last month. Some of you may have heard. And the guest for today's conversation is the wonderful, brilliant, always hilarious Pete Holmes. Pete is probably best known for his comedic work in stand-up comedy. He's the creator and star of the HBO show Crashing. He's also an author and just an incredible, brilliant, and hilarious person. You may also recognize Pete from his wonderful podcast, which is You Made It Weird which is just an excellent podcast name. And Sharon's been a guest there a couple times. So this conversation today is looking at the larger journeys in our lives. And Pete has a really unique story in that he grew up in a fundamental Christian house and has taken really a whole path of finding his own spirituality and finding different teachers. He was a close student of Ram Dass and many of the themes from real life he brings to life in, in a pretty incredible way, talking about the many ups and downs and what we take with us in these larger cycles. So it's a very personal conversation and a lot of wonderful appearances by Ram Dass in different forms. So before we get to it, a couple quick announcements. Sharon has a few different virtual events coming up. You can always check out her calendar at SharonSalzberg.com. There's one I'd like to highlight for you, which is a virtual day-long immersion that's happening. It's May 13th hosted by Garrison Institute. And Sharon will be joining Otman Smith, Ali Smith, and Andres Gonzalez of the Holistic Life Foundation, looking at the capacity, the meaning, the depth of love. Then it will be meditation, yoga, contemplative practice. It's a whole mix of things. So you can join us for that if you feel inspired. And one other quick shout out to the New York Times, who just put out an article a few days ago by Hope Reese, highlighting eight different books for meditation, of which Sharon's book, Real Happiness, was included. And this is the book that whenever somebody asks me, like for their uncle or their nephew, they want a book for somebody who wants to get into meditation. This is the one I always recommend. It's quite different from Sharon's other books in that it's really an instruction manual and it has all different types of meditation. So it's perfect for anybody who's wanting to start a home practice or just need some foundational instruction. So a big thanks to them for including us so let's get into the episode, Pete Holmes and Sharon Salzberg. Welcome back to The Summit. I'm Sharon Salzberg, and we're speaking today about the journey we take from contraction to expansion. I'm here with my friend Pete Holmes. 
and so grateful to be here with my friend Pete Holmes. He's a comedian, a writer, an actor, a cartoonist, podcast host, an author, and spiritual seeker. His book, Comedy Sex God, explores his relationship with faith and comedy. His popular podcast, You Made It Weird, is a comedic exploration of the meaning of life, with guests ranging from Seth Rogen to Blake Griffin. As a comedian, Pete created and starred in the semi-autobiographical HBO show Crashing, which he executive produced alongside Judd Apatow. He's an accomplished stand-up comedian as well, with numerous television specials and innumerous late-night appearances. So, Pete, it is such a delight, first of all, to see you again, Yeah, uh, to have you with us today. Thank you so much oh, for my joining pleasure. us. You don't um, hear numerous and innumerous that close together, usually, except in a poorly written bio by me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was just saying, I didn't write that. I no, read I it. No, I did. Okay. <laughs> One of the funniest things about being a comedian is you're asked to write your own biography, which is a, li- a little bit like writing your own eulogy. <laughs> you have to be like, here, instead of lies, here comes comedian Pete Holmes, who was known for this. So really? it, it, they're all written by me. Well, it's either written by oneself or the assumption of someone else, right? Yeah, no, if, if someone else writes it, they never quite get it right, <laughs> in my opinion. I mean, what do you want? I mean, you, you have bios. You have mm. people writing bios, and they just lead with the wrong thing or the wrong voice. So it's always just easier to go like, it's my ego. Let me uh, let me frame it. <laughs> you know, I'm the master of it. I designed it. Let me tell you what it is. <laughs> right. Well, part of the journey from contraction to expansion is not defining oneself by the views of others, right? Mm-hmm. I can remember well, the first time I ever read about myself that she's one of America's most beloved <laughs> meditation teachers. I was so touched, you know, mm-hmm. excited. I thought, wow, people love me, you know? Yeah. So great. And I thought, I wonder how they figured it out. Like, did they do a survey? Did they do a poll? So I asked my publisher, I said, how did you find out? And he said, I made it up. Yep. And I said, you uh, made it up. I was like, it's yes. Made up? <laughs> yes. Isn't I mean, isn't that deeply profound? It's just made up. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go one better. Yeah. Ramdas gave a quote for my book. I wrote it. I mean, that's just how it goes. If somebody's uh-huh. 87 years old and, you know, hanging out with their guru in a post-stroke state of elderliness, you don't ask them to whip up a fresh one. This isn't even that. I'm not even embarrassed to share that. It's like I wrote it. I know his voice. I tried to put it in his voice. He read it. He liked it. He said you can do it. He put his name on it. But that's show business. I actually think, not to jump too far ahead, but the identification of the falseness of that glory, that sort of like, you know, it, it, it's empty. How, how many stories end like, and you get in the special room and it's empty, or you climb the ladder and there's nothing up there? Well, in the good way, nothing will show you that faster that, that fame is a agreed upon conceit, for example. It's only valuable as long as people believe it, but that means mm-hmm. it can go away. Not to mm-hmm. jump into teaching right away, but I love that Ramdas really seemed to understand that. As a famous mm-hmm. person himself, he was like, he always quoted the King James Version, was something like, lay not your treasure where dust and moth can corrupt. And if that's not the cornerstone of my practice. But for me, meaning specialness, a specialness addiction. Um, but I I feel very grace, uh, like a lot of grace has been given to me in that the spotlight helps me identify. And I don't say ego, like looking down my nose, like this disgusting wildebeest. I'm just like, it helped me see this thing that I trot around and, and people can like it or not like it. And, and I kind of, I'm paid to bring that ego to cities and he shows up and people like it or they don't. But it actually, it helped my spiritual practice. Whereas growing up Christian, I think I, I always thought that the rock stars and the comedians and the actors and the anybody famous was at a handicap. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people in show business, just like a lot of people in a lot of professions are deeply up their own butts. But I'm hopeful that me and and there are other examples that can kind of work with it. I'm not saying I haven't figured it out, but it actually becomes like this strange, you go so far down it that you actually come up on your own tail and go like, oh, oh, okay. Because to to know you have a problem, you have to know what you're talking about first. And I think that's, Mm -hmm. it's been helpful to kind of mine and extricate and bring out my false self to use another word for it. 
and 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 love it and be okay with it but go like you know Sharon's editor made that up and 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 I write my own bios and I write my own Ram Dass quotes it's all beautiful nonsense and that can kind of for a specialness addict like me make it just a little bit less serious you know it's <laughs> like oh okay. well, it's great well I mean I was going off of what you said we've we had the same experience yeah well I remember uh, there was a day I had an epiphany which was basically fame is something that happens in other people's minds mm. it means more people recognize your name or think they know you yes than you know actually it doesn't even happen in your own mind you can't like sit down with it and you know show it <laughs> to me there's nothing there this is this is oh my gosh we're right in it I mean I think it's really funny when people get mad at Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines doesn't exist. There's a plane and, and, and there might be a pattern. There might be like an algorithm or, or some data that we could compile and be like, well, the planes that are marked Delta fail more often. But yeah, that's, that's true. That's valid. But when your plane is delayed and let's say it's something completely nobody's fault, it's just something happened and you're mad at Delta. It, you, you know, I understand that makes the world a little less chaotic, but for me, I actually find a great relief in going, there is no Delta. Like Delta doesn't exist in the same way. That, and either you find this hopeful or, or maybe it makes you a little nervous and scared. I, I can feel both ways, but it's like, I also don't exist. I'm a conceit. I'm I'm a structure. You know, it's, it's again, it's Ram Dass. I'll pretend you're Sharon if you'll pretend I'm Pete. And I'll even reinforce it with myself. I'll say something and be like, well, that sounds like something Pete would say. So I start to believe. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the problem is, is if you really believe you're Pete, then, um, and this is my Angelou, I think about what she said all the time. She said it to Dave Chappelle. She said, don't pick it up, don't lay it down. Meaning, Sharon, you're the greatest. Sharon, you're the worst. Just try to let it go. That's why spirituality. Spirituality is interested in what doesn't change. And that is, I'm a sensitive person, I'm an anxious person. So the call to something steady, the backdrop or the screen or the hum or the field, whatever you want to call it, spirit that didn't change, that was with me when I was eight, was with me when I was 18, 28, 38, hopefully when I'm 48, hopefully when I'm 88, what didn't change? And that that's worth looking at because you know, here one day, gone the next, opinions, fame, favor, mm -hmm. fame, game, shame, loss, gain, same. I'm quoting Ram Dass like crazy because I love being with other people <laughs> that love him. Uh-huh. That's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yes, in the journey, as I was talking about it, I mean, especially in this book, Real Life, I was describing as an arc, like starting with more contracted, painful states, feeling trapped the narrowness of, of narrow-mindedness or having a closed heart. And then those places of deep suffering to some kind of emergence and expansion and openness of awareness and understanding and certainly love and, and compassion. So um, with lots of ups and downs in the midst of it all. Yeah. Because no journey I think is ever linear. It's just not like that. And I'm wondering if you could share with us something about your journey of faith and transformation. How'd you get to be a spiritual stand-up comedian? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think I might be the only person. I, I watch my stand-up and I go like, that, that's that got uh, something to it. And a lot of people just hear that I said, like, fuck or ass or something. And I'm <laughs> like, oh, man, like, that's disappointing to me, but whatever. So I appreciate that you think I'm that. <laughs> It's a very classic, what I heard you talking about, there was the hero's journey and, and it's that, it is a contracted place. And one of my great teachers, Richard Rohr, who's kind of the Ram Dass of the Franciscans, I would say, Richard taught me transcend and include, meaning I have transcended fundamentalist Christianity, but it took a lot of work. I, I don't spit on it and I don't, you know, salt the earth and, and, or disgrace it, meaning it was the entry point, but it was a little contracted for, for me. I can't speak for all of it. And I can't even speak for everybody that was at my church. I'm saying the way that I interpreted it, going back to what you were saying, it was all me. I heard certain things. I glommed onto guilt. I glommed onto fear. I, I responded to that. So I ended up making more of a relationship with that. It was reinforced externally as far as I could tell. So I had a lot of that fear. I, I sometimes said that like I loved... Um, some sense of a creator, some sense of a purpose, some sense of 
meaning, but like stapled to it, like a sneaky amendment in Congress where, where all these other things like Buddhists go to hell, gay people go to hell. I mean, like everybody, the wrong type of Christians are going to hell. Also, just the concept of hell was very, very difficult to me. I, I was going around 12 years old going like, why aren't we all talking about this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was like, it seemed like the strangest thing to just keep in your mind along with like state capitals and like where you keep your key. It was a casual fact or it was a very not casual fact. And you had the fire and brimstone people. But in my church, which is kind of like, yeah, we're going to heaven. Everybody's going to hell. And that led, I went to Israel. I went to Jerusalem to study one semester and I was determined to like figure out what was going on with hell and ask the Jewish teachers there, the rabbis there and all this stuff. Turned out most people weren't really that interested in it. It, it wasn't it wasn't as fascinating or, or troubling as it was to me. But that started, that was sort of the thread that I pulled that made it start to fall apart a little bit. But I really just put it aside like a lot of people. And this is the suffering grace thing. Then my wife leaves me. I got married when I was 22. She had an affair. And a big part of my faith was that if you paid into the mafia, mafia being God, that God would protect your bakery. <laughs> what about my bread? <laughs> Exa- well, yeah, somebody threw a brick through the window and they they burned it down as far as I was concerned. And I was like, what was all that not swearing, not drinking, not smoking? I didn't watch dirty movies or whatever it was. Like, I did what I thought I was being asked to do. And yet still... At the time, looking back, it seems like not that big of a deal. But when you're 28, very sheltered and naive, and you think you have this good thing going, and then not only are they leaving you, but they've been having sex behind your back, and and it's shameful. It's the opposite of what a specialness addict wants. I want to look like I'm amazing and I'm the best partner. And even right now, there's an urgency to say, like, I was a good partner. We weren't having like a bad relationship. I just wasn't a grown person. I was a baby boy. I didn't even know what I didn't know. Mm-hmm. So I was like too sweet, too doting, too gentle. I just, I know it's weird to say too gentle, but like I wasn't being real. I was playing a part. You understand. Mm-hmm. So when that happened, I did what a lot of people do on the hero's journey is, you know, you resist the call. You're being called to something new. You're being called into the wilderness, in my case, being a comedian and going back to Manhattan. And I resisted that. And then eventually I said yes to it. And then eventually I I started meeting the people along the way. And a lot of the beautiful teachers at first were atheists. And they started teaching me these honestly very beautiful things, uh, things why they weren't afraid. They had answers to questions like, why aren't you afraid? And they would say things like, where were you during the Renaissance? You know? like something beautiful like that. Why are you afraid of death? When death is, I am not. When I am, death is not. I think that's Epicurean or something. But I would learn these things. And also I'd learn these things like, why don't you steal? If there's no God and no hell, why aren't you stealing? I I remember this vividly. I was in a Holiday Inn Express and these two comedians were like both atheists. And they were like, well, if you steal the person that works here, you know, they count the granola bars and maybe now they lose their job and now they can't eat. And, And I was like, what is going on here? Like these people don't care if you're gay. They don't care if you're Buddhist. They don't care if you're whatever. They, I, I was like, this is the compassion and the all inclusive yesness that I've been looking for. But it was just extremely humanist. So for a brief time, I, I considered myself a heratheist. It just means I stopped thinking about it. But I was very happy about letting go of the angry God who wanted to kick me into a furnace. And just like Ramdas, when I don't want to flatter myself, but similar to Ramdas, when I was, I think it was either 30 or 31, so many stories like this, and I do want to preface it with it doesn't have to go this way, it just happened to go this way for me. I was performing at a comedy, at a music fest called Bonnaroo, and I took mushrooms and somebody told me it was like weed. They were like, it's like strong marijuana. And no, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not like strong marijuana. Maybe it is. I've never had marijuana like that. And I, it wasn't that I had a God experience. It's that I had an experience that I couldn't put into words full stop. The word for that is ineffable. And I had never had an ineffable experience. The only thing that I really vividly remember other than some visual things, it was a pretty light dose, but I remember thinking, oh, great, I'm going to have to talk about this 
and ruin it. And I mean, I, I get the chills when I say that because something bigger than me, that is me, but in me or whatever you want to say, I didn't have any of that language. I knew you couldn't talk about it. So when I came down and just went about my day, it's not like I was like, I saw God or I'm religious or spiritual or anything. I just kind of came back, realized I couldn't talk about it, realized I had felt this openness. Ram Das talks about his trip. It's like, it's almost worse coming back because you felt what it was like to be spacious and open. And I came back and I was like, oh my God. I also remember thinking that's what I've been looking for. I, I was a pretty, he not heavy, but drinking a lot at the time. And I was like, that's what I wanted alcohol to do is, is just to open me up. Sometimes it would, but not always. Anyway, long story short, I feel like I don't want to talk too much, but it made me interested in what are the things we can't talk about directly. That led me to Joseph Campbell. I think he's on my wall. Yeah, he's right there. I don't know if you can see. This is Joseph Campbell right there. And I watched his PBS series, The Power of Myth. I learned mm -hmm. about metaphor. I learned about, this is a Richard Rohr quote, but truth is so big, you can only speak about them with lies. Things that mm -hmm. are always true, but sometimes really happen. And transrationality, things that aren't irrational, and they're also not rational, but they're transrational. And that leads me to Joseph Campbell's definition of God, which is a metaphor for a mystery that absolutely transcends all categories of human thought, including being and non-being. So it even transcends the category of it, it exists or it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're dogs trying to understand the internet. But the best we can do is through symbol and story and metaphor. But better than that, the story and the symbol and the metaphor can actually transform you in reality into it. This is a very Ram Dass thing. You can become it. You can't think it. You can't perfectly talk about it. You can't perfectly teach it, but you can become it. And then I heard about people like Maharaji and then Ramana Maharshi and others, obviously the Buddha. Now Jesus is back in the mix. You know, I, like I have a different understanding of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The homecoming of that reunion was very emotional. It still is. I was like, oh my God. I, and I got that from Maharaji. But I started to see that it wasn't about a clan or a tribal identity. It was about an experience. The joke that I tell on stage sometimes is I say, you know, I learned around this time from Barry Taylor, the road manager for ACDC. He said, God is the name of the blanket we put over the mystery to give it a shape so we can talk about it, right? And I, I yell this on stage. I go, shouldn't I have learned this in church? Why am I learning this from the road manager from ACDC? Like it's, it's exactly mm -hmm. what Richard Rohr says. It's like, God hiding in the most unexpected places, mm -hmm. and yet it's still discouraged to look in. I, I've found God, love, holiness in bars. I've found it in sex. I've found it in disbelief. I've found it in doubt. I've found it in brokenness. When really I just thought it was the shimmering flag I sailed into like American consumeristic achievement that I brought my God with me. He got to come with me. I was like, no, he was hiding. Who says it? It first comes the fall, then comes the recovery from the fall. Mm -hmm. Both are the grace of God. And God That's comes beautiful. to us disguised as our lives as Paula de Arce. They might both mm -hmm. be Paula de Arce. This is wonderful. I have so many things bubbling up for me. <laughs> yes, you know, I'm sure. to you. It's great. No, it's really beautiful. I realized you were one of the last people I was together with physically before, you know, the kind of shutdown happened yes. in 2020. Yeah. Actually at your house. Uh, oh, that's right. That's in right. California. Yeah. And your beautiful family. Yes. And child. And, and then uh, it hasn't been the same since. I know. But in that process, one of the questions I asked myself repeatedly for a number of reasons, um, as, you know, expectations got shattered. I was in Barry instead of New York or traveling. I was, Things changed so significantly. Yeah. The retreat center, the Insight Meditation Society had shut down. And one of the questions I asked myself repeatedly was, what's still true? Mm. Like, what am I counting on? One of the meanings of the word Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A in Sanskrit, which is usually translated as the truth or the laws of nature or something like that. One of its meanings is that which I can rely on, mm. that which will support me. So I thought, okay, what am I relying on? You know, what is the Dharma of this moment? And some of it, of course, was my practice and the tools that I learned along the way and the immense gratitude I felt for having some tools. 
And some of it was kind of perspective. And, you know, like the quotation from the Buddha that I think about probably more than any other quotation is, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. Hmm. And part of the reason I think of it so much is it amuses me that the Buddha, like Mr. Impermanence, said this is an eternal law. Oh, wow. It's not the kind of language that you know, often used. And so it's so disagreeable in some circumstances. We all know that, if we're being honest. Like here, too, hmm. I'm supposed to bring love into this, this. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there it is. This is an eternal <clears throat> law. And so these things aren't always easy, but they tend to be the things that remind us, that bring us back to our most essential commitments or values or the things that make us happy that maybe we've forgotten about. And so part of my description and my efforts to describe a journey is talking about what we bring with us. You know, and you've had quite a journey from this deeply religious Christian background to the mushroom trip or whatever, <laughs> and finding Ram Dass as a guru. And is there something you would point to as what you have taken with you more than anything? Through every step, you mean? Through most of the steps, at any rate. I mean, really every step, but we don't always acknowledge it. Yeah, it's a beautiful question. I think what made me spiritual before I even knew really the difference between spiritual or religious or it's still kind of fuzzy, but like I still remember, and I don't have a great memory from my childhood, but I remember being a what is this kid. And th that's one of the early chapters of my my book, I almost called the book, What Is This? Because I think that's, you could say it's a mantra, it, it, meaning if you're asking, what is this? There's something in The Course in Miracles that says like, instead of telling something what it is, ask it what it is. And I know that's not the only place where a teaching like that exists. I, I know Eckhart Tolle talks about that, drop the label, drop the story, lots of practices have it. But what is this was something that I seemed to get an extra dose of when I was a kid. So that stayed with me for sure. So much so that even when I get to a point where I think I'm really clean and I have just the right models uh, and stories that really just resonate with me, it's still from all the way back before I even got super religious, looking at fire and saying, what is this? Or looking at your hand, what is this? Rupert Spira, another great teacher of mine taught me what is it that's aware of your experience? I think that's the most important question and sort of the cornerstone of, of everything, of all, all the traditions that I can think of, is asking a question that almost no one else is asking, which is something, Rupert would start with, something is aware of my experience. What is it? Let's talk about it. Does it change? Muji would say, is there a boundary on the other side of which it is not? So you start to get this sense of, something eternal and, and something timeless. I know I just said the same thing kind of, but unborn, not you, but very much you that you can mm -hmm. kind of get in touch with. So when I was asking what is fire, really what I was saying was, what am I? What am I in relation to this? What What is it in me that is seeing this, that feels the heat of this, that, that register? The metaphor that Rupert uses, he, again, he's not the only one, but is the screen. We're all watching this movie and we're also entranced by this movie. And we all get lost in the movie, just like we get lost in the movies. But like, what is the screen? Like, what is the what is the unchanging dharma or the, the the constant upon which everything is written? I sometimes think of myself as a piece of paper, and every sound is a dot or a, a stroke or something. And some are little because they seem far away, and some are big brush strokes because they seem really loud, and my dog barks or something. But they're both written on the same paper, meaning. They're as close as they could be to me. They are me. They're written on me. And that, that, that is certainly that wonder and that not knowing has stayed with me the whole time. There have been times when I was pretty sure I had the answer to the universe. But that's what contemplation is, is, is just asking yourself, what is this? Just why this rock? Why why anything? And it doesn't have to be phenomenal. Like we're talking over the internet. That's pretty special and interesting. Just like, what? <laughs> Pick anything. <laughs> I really like that question in part for me, you know, as well, because usually we think of it really from another direction, which is what have you let go of? That's what people ask or, hmm. or what you might reflect on. Like, 
you know, just listening to you today, I think, um, well, to a large degree, clearly he's let go of an addiction to specialness, right? Hmm. And if the thoughts or feelings of the yearning still arises, it's not the same. So he's let go of some confusion or some delusion, some really illusion maybe is the best word for love, where happiness yeah. is to be found. Like, I don't think so, you know? It's fleeting. I, I mean, it's one of those things where most people would, would like to find out for themselves and I wouldn't begrudge anybody. I, yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, I've put a lot of work into doing what I do and, and there's satisfaction. It's hard to talk about it, but meaning it's impermanent. And that concept that happiness, you could say salvation, you could say conversion, you could say nirvana, you could say anything, but that realization is outside of you is um is really uh it's first it's reinforced constantly everywhere but the again to say something from a course in miracles one of the lessons is um salvation comes from me and i, I find that to be very very powerful as a meditation meaning i get caught up believing that salvation or conversion or whatever enlightenment comes from I mean, if I'm being really honest, there comes from specialness, comes from that type of love. People think I'm great. I made them laugh. They they thought I was cool. But I'll tell you that without fully disowning it, I still do that and I still get fun out of it. It's just where moth and dust and rust corrupt, you know. So looking for which I know you're you're all about too. It's a happiness for no reason. It's finding a consistent merging place. I think it's in the gospel where they talk about it being like a wellspring. It's like there's this place where this, the thing that's looking out your eyes originates and getting really close to that. I mean, to make it practical, but when your flight is delayed or when you're in traffic or when you're waiting medical news, these are times when I go like, can't we get in touch with the reality that everything is a memory? Everything you're doing just becomes a memory. <laughs> like, I mean, it's gone. It's written on running water or it's projected on running water. I had a perfect travel day. I was recently in Toronto. I was coming home. Everything just went my way. And it was really tempting to be like, this is it. I'm in the flow. And I was like, here I am talking to you. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's okay. It's okay. But it's gone. So it's dumb. <laughs> I just don't as much. And I'm a person, we've already touched on this. I have an extraordinary special life, right? I'm here to say I don't think it works that when I'm old or let's maybe I'm not old and they tell me I'm dying. I don't think I'm going to sit around going like, oh man, I was on Conan O'Brien 12 times. Get that out of here. I don't even think it works to say at least I'm 90 years old. I don't think it works. Yeah. I don't think it works to say I changed the world or I invented this or I did that or I was, I don't even think it works to say I was kind or I wasn't a piece of crap. I, I'm i not to say that there might be like, it's nice to not have regret or guilt, but I'm saying I don't think it works to sit in a rocking chair as you're fading away and just be like, at least I kicked a lot of ass. I think you need to go nonsense is leaving. I just texted it to myself. It's in the Bhagavad Gita, which I can never say. It is. The unreal has no being. The real never ceases to be. That's a rocking chair thought. That's a rock. Who dies? As Stephen Levine said, who dies? That's the question. Because everything is gone. And the moment we die will be another moment. It'll be another now. It'll be another now. And we think if we bolster it with enough thens, we'll go like, I'm okay to die? Nonsense. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. peace comes from going Amma, when I saw Amma, the hugging saint, she told this beautiful story. Uh, obviously, it was in Hindi, but somebody translated. Mm -hmm. And she was like, there was a doctor at, at, at visiting a hospital. He was the visiting doctor, and he brought his dog to work, and he was visiting a patient who was dying. His dog was on the other side of the door, and he was scratching the door. And the patient was saying, was nervous about dying, and, and he let his dog in. And he said, see, my dog has never been to this hospital before. 
my dog doesn't know where it's going. My dog could be scared, but it knew that it wanted to come in here because that's where its master was. Like, that's you. It's a going home. It's a return. It's a journey back. That's a rocking chair thought, not, oh, I met Bono. Get the fuck out of here. Give me a million I met Bonos. <laughs> or that pizza was so good. Get like pictures of our food. I mean, enjoy life, but I don't think it has that cumulative effect that we think it has. And I've never been to India, but the stories of people living in abject poverty that seem to have that connection. This is why that's so confusing to the West. What do you got to be happy about? Well, that's a great question. I think that's worth looking into. It is. <laughs> One of the great gifts of the many gifts that Ram Dass bestowed upon us as a culture was an interest in working with dying people and learning from them, you know, mm -hmm. because I think the things you're describing, and you are very funny, um, <laughs> but uh, comedic sex god, um, <laughs> uh, was I was just having this memory of somebody that I knew who was kind of in a mode of wanting to look deeper at things in life and there was some time of transition and then they got offered an opportunity which they did not want where they would make a lot of money and have to work immense number of hours every week and and their partner said to them something like I'm afraid that when you're dying if you don't take it you'll just be full of regret mm. and I said I don't think that's what people tend to regret you know Yes. When they're dying, you know, it's not you think, I should have taken that job, really. Oh, you know, that, that would have been a better, like, I don't think so. Yes. That's not what happens. And Ram Dass is a vehicle for that understanding. Mm. You know, be in the room and listen, things like that. It was so phenomenal. So even just talking to you at all, I feel a lot of missing of Ram Dass. And Me too. it feels like he's also, it's funny to say, because he feels present and also missing at the mm. same time. Yeah. And I would love to hear about your first meeting with him. I actually don't know how you came to meet him and, and uh, how you knew he'd be a teacher of yours. Oh, boy. I, I love talking about him, just like I love talking. about. I, I have a picture up, up there of, of he and I, and this is a brag. He, the last time I saw him, he went, brother. And it just meant so much to me. So it says brothers on it. It's my prized moment. Again, I don't I don't know if in the rocking chair I'll be like, Ramda said I was his brother. But anyway, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I was on an airplane and I was listening. I always tell people to start with a, a series called Experiments in Truth, which is a Gandhi quote. He doesn't say it in there, but it's on iTunes. I believe it's classified as an audio book. But Be Here Now to me was just too difficult to crack because it wasn't, you know, the 60s when I read it and I wasn't in a communal living situation. You know what I mean? It, it's a great thing to read, I think, after you have its voice in your head. I think that's the way I approach it. So Experiments in Truth, the first track, I think it's like six tracks and they're about an hour, a little over each. I was writing on like a like an airline napkin, just trying to write down everything. And I realized like this would be easier to write down what I don't like because I was just transcribing it. I wasn't taking notes. I was making a transcription. <laughs> and obviously there's a lot going on. He's, we're both from Boston, the Boston area. So there's some dad karma there, just like he had from Maharaji. I feel like a father thing and a, and a brother thing. But I just was blown away by somebody with an academic mind, like a sharp mind like that, that could articulate these things. And obviously there's dozens, there's hundreds, but he was the first one that I found that wasn't just like, hey man, like, you know, let's smoke a J and look at a crystal. It wasn't like that. It was like a very sharp person. And I was blown away by how funny he was. So I, I listened to it on a plane. The reason I listened to it on a plane was because I did Duncan Trussell's podcast. And he told me, he had bananas out from Maharaji, which I thought was really weird. Um, <laughs> there's no bananas in front of my Maharaji. I don't do it like that, but I understand it now. And you can listen to the first time somebody told me about Ram Dass. I think it's a nice little treasure that I can listen to the first time somebody told me about Ram Dass. But I, it didn't hook me until I listened to it on the airplane. Duncan, who I love dearly and I, I owe him so much, changing my life. It, it wasn't until I heard him speak. And then... Years later, again at Duncan, following Duncan, I went to a retreat. And I don't know where it is, but I have a picture of me sitting across from him. It looks like something from the 50s, like I look like a smitten boy. 
<laughs> like on a date, sharing a milkshake mm -hmm. with two straws, just sitting with this old man. Like it, now I have these photos that make no sense to people. Like, why are you staring at this old man? Like you're in love. And it's because we were, we went to love together. We were in love together. And can I tell you this about the first time we met? Cause it speaks to what we were talking about. I told him, and this helps me time date it, crashing must've been on. And there was a character in crashing named leaf. And I was so obsessed with Ramdas and other teachers that I would sometimes have Leaf say things that they said. It would often get cut out, <laughs> like sometimes to my behest, but it would be cut out. So I told Ramdas this, like, oh, I have this show, it's on HBO. If I was being fully honest, I would have been like, and that's a very prestigious network, you know, it's, it's, it's the Sopranos and all this stuff. What did you tell him? And like, and I have a character who quotes you sometimes, and there was just no change, nothing happened which was very confusing to my specialness. Sidebar, this happened. I told Richard Rohr, if I have a son, I want to name him Rohr. Same thing. Because when you're in Cleveland, you don't need to drive to Cleveland. Like, there's the, oh, now I like you. I mean, my whole life has been, oh, now I like you. My whole life has been like, of course you love me. I'm so special. Of course you love me. I'm so glittery. I'm so interested. Whatever it is, I've earned it. I've won it. I like hunting. I, I, I shot the deer of love and I brought it back. Then you meet these confusing people that just love. The faucet was just left on in this careless person's house and they're just giving it away. And that was beautifully confounding to me to watch him not, honestly, not give a crap about what I was saying. So I, I came back and I came back and I came back and there's lots and lots of stories, but I eventually went and sat with him twice on a private retreat. And that's when it was almost, it, the second time was when he was not really talking anymore. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of, just kind of hung out and, and it, it shaped my, I think maybe that's why I go to that image of, what am I going to be saying in a rocking chair? Because Ramana spent years in a chair. He mm -hmm. was in a reclining mm -hmm. chair. And what was he doing? He was remembering the symbols and the people and the mantras and the songs and the smells and the sights that brought him back into the place where he wasn't thinking, I love you, Sharon. I forgive you, Sharon. Where you become forgiveness, where you become love low bottom shelf forgiveness where it's like, well, Sharon was a jerk to me, but I, you know mm -hmm. what? I look mm -hmm. the other way. I spent a lot of my life doling that out and receiving it. And it sucks. I want that top shelf. I want mercy and love that are so open that they actually offend the ego. The ego would actually prefer if they would draw the line here or here or here, here. I want that pure white light. And I think that's what Ram Dass and, and Richard Rohr and others are doing as they get old. New, uh, I thought it was Emmys. I thought it was Oscars. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Which can break. Yeah, of course. One, well, it's the, the Oscar is already broken, Chair. <laughs> you know, yeah, I know you know. This it's Oscar true. is already it's even 99 cents. <laughs> we were earning yesterday's news for one thing, you know, and it's like, oh, oh no, gosh. you know. Yeah, yeah, lining a, a birdcage. I've been replaced. What? What? Forget it. Forget yeah. it. It's a treadmill. It's silly. And as Lama Suryadas says, just rest your weary mind. There's something so. Rest your weary mind. It was his teacher, Nishal Ken Rinpoche. Oh, rest forget. your weary mind. When I hear that, and I don't know if you're the same, but I get a sense that, that that's good news to us that we go, oh, there's mm -hmm. a way to rest a weary Like, yeah. I didn't know what, like, I'd pray for anxiety to go away mm -hmm. and to just simple stuff. Like the answer you're looking for is who you are. So you just need to remove the impediments. It might just be deep breathing. It might just be surrendering. It, it might just, mm -hmm. Val is my wife. She's incredible. She'll just say like, maybe just say, this is how I feel or, or something we picked up. Maybe from you at the retreat. If I feel this way the rest of my life, it's okay. Is that you? Uh, it's I mean, me or Joseph. Could I mean, we Joseph. use that all the time. If I, it, your nervous system has no idea what to do. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. The love and the mercy and the welcome that just goes like, 
if I feel this way the rest of my life, it's okay. It doesn't know what to do. It self-destructs. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I wanted to mention that you're remarried and that you have a beautiful daughter. Yes. The kind of yeah, you know, Lila. Lila. Which, she is the best. She is the absolute best and a great. How old is she now? She's four. Let me see. She's a beautiful thing. So before we end, I just want to bring up the question of faith because you use the word despair, which is fascinating to me. And and subsequent to that, I'll ask you if you will lead us in, in some kind of practice. But I wrote a book on faith, you know, called Faith. Mm-hmm. And many people said to me, don't call it that. You know, you'll be in trouble because call it trust or or something like that. And I said, well, I, I don't want to call it trust. I want to call it faith, you know. <laughs> and it was a tough word for a lot of people in different communities. I mean, yet you grew up with it. And I think very, very closely held. And when you described yourself as a little boy, you actually reminded me of a friend of mine who grew up in the Church of England. And he said that every week, even at a very young age, when he would hear, love thy neighbor as thyself, he said he felt thrilled. It was like, hmm. it was just overwhelmed by the beauty of that. And then he would always, on the other hand, get into trouble because his first question was how? Hmm. How do we love our neighbor? We don't really like our neighbor very much. We don't like ourselves very much, it seems like. How? And that edge really got him into a lot of trouble, but actually defines his faith. And so yeah. uh, when I was working on this book and, and I was working <clears throat> with an editor, I was saying that from the Buddhist point of view, which is really where most of my training had come from, we don't say that doubt is the enemy of faith. Doubt, when it's the right kind of doubt, when it's a sincere questioning and wondering and not knowing, really enhances faith. Mm-hmm. So she said to me, what's the opposite of faith then? And I had one of those experiences, you know, where these words just come out of your mouth. And I said, despair. Mm. And mm. I think that's right, because if faith is connection to inner strength, to bigger picture of life, to one another, despair is the sundering of connection. Mm. And it would be the opposite. And you talked about despair a little bit earlier. And in light of your journey, where you said grace was there too. Mm-hmm. I wonder if there's anything you can add to my sense of faith and the way I hold it. Yeah. Well, I, I do love that. It's funny. Again, Richard Roy taught me that religion, I'm sure you know this, but religio, it's like ligament. It's like to connect. So religion is supposed to connect. So with that, I would firmly agree the idea that faith is this connection to one another, to the cosmos, to your creator, whatever you want to say. And I like that the opposite is despair. It reminds me of Eckhart Tolle. He says, like, the opposite of death is birth. Life has no opposite. That just blew my mind. That was on my fridge for a while. (laughs) This also came to mind. It might not entirely speak to faith, but hopefully I can bring it there. I so relate to your friend that said, love your neighbor. And it's like, how? And mystical Christianity does a really good job at answering that. But my branch of Christianity, like his, in my opinion, fell short because for me, it was all about being nice. It was about smiling and, and being, you know, putting on patience or putting on kindness, especially on church grounds. At least that was true for me. I, I, Richard Rohr again says the word nice isn't in the entire New Testament, which I think is really funny. So I, I don't know if this is in my book. I sure hope it is. It was at some point. I think it's important to note, and I learned this from Ramdas. it's like the commandment is to love your neighbor. It's not like your neighbor. And I I know that sounds like semantics, but I think it's a really important thing. First of all, love doesn't necessarily mean liking them or jiving with them or having lunch with them or or constantly hanging out with them or whatever. It means recognizing who they are and who you are. Mm -hmm. And not even on an intellectual level. This this is what when people have their minds blown on psychedelics, but you can also get it through through practice, I'm happy to say. You can you can remember and remember and remember until it becomes I find it very helpful to look at somebody as if I'm dreaming, as if it's a projection of, of myself, or if we're, we're in the same sort of gelatinous snow globe, you know, meaning I love them because I see the part of them that is me, past me. I don't mean Pete, but me, deep, deep, deep down. And then you can love. But it doesn't mean you have to hang out with, you know, Kathy, the white supremacist every Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, that's polity, you know, that's being polite. I don't know yeah. if I use polity right, but that's um, the appearance. So I hope that was something. I'm yeah, with no, you. 
Faith is tricky. I, I, I will say I was giving a, a lot of crashing was improvised in the last episode of, of the whole show. I was doing a stand up routine and I was talking about God. It was, it was going to be, it ended up getting edited out again at my behest. <laughs> but it was this thing about how we're all in this together. We're all floating on a space rock. We don't know how we got here. We're confused. And someone yelled out, have faith. It was a background actor who are literally paid to not talk, but that's how compelled they were to yell out, have faith. So I have seen how that can be weaponized. It becomes the certainty of uncertain things. Richard Rohr's definition of faith, sorry to quote everybody, but I am a student. So I, I just want to give credit to these people. He said, we've turned faith into the opposite of what it is. Faith is supposed to be comfort with not knowing. You know, it, it's supposed to be this, it's like the dog running in the room again. It's like, I don't have to know. There are times when I can become it, but I, I there there's also times of doubt. But that also reminds me of the lotus flower growing in the mud. Like it, it was a divorce. It was drugs. It was all these things that I want, it was hanging out with atheists. Atheists taught me how to love my name. Like, what is going on here? Like, that is, to me, because it's what happened, that feels so much, it's precious. It's, it's this dirty, clumsy, stumbling, muddy, bloody, gross, absurd, sometimes cold, sometimes dark, sometimes sunny journey. And you keep finding God or truth in the most unlikely of places. And that's how you know you're doing it right. You belong to a really long lineage of people that, that, had, that did it the same way. That mm -hmm. it, it's not, it wasn't just supposed to be handed to you. If you could hand it to someone, you would. But I don't think it works like that. Wow. So uh, I'm so sorry we have to stop. If only it could be permanent, but it's not. Therefore, it's already a memory. Pressure. Yeah, where is it? We can watch it. <laughs> I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. Uh, before we finish our conversation for now, I would love yeah. it if you would lead us in some kind of reflection or, yeah. or uh, meditation or story that's meaningful to you. Yeah, I, I was. I've done this before, but it's interesting. I'm going to, you know, try and. Do it fresh. I know that's that's what you do for your job. It's like you say things you've said before, but I want you to know that even though I'm repeating myself, that it, that I'm here with you. Again, it's in my book, but it it is the practice. I don't know why, but I woke up this morning with, and by this morning, I mean like three. It was still dark. Just had a lot of anxiety. I think it was a, a, a biochemical thing, like literally something I ate. Nothing particular is going on in my life. But there's always something, and I was just very anxious and. Again, Belle, the mindfulness teacher that she is, would I, I thought of her, she was like, just, just this is how I feel. But sometimes I need something even a little bit more pointed. And the mantra that I use the most uh, is something that came to me. But it's very simple. It's just, yes, thank you. It's, I, I didn't make that up. But yes, thank you is the most memorable, meaning you can be in a really tight spot and you can still remember yes, thank you and useful and practical. The example that I give, uh, I think you'll be able to relate because it relates to my book. So I'm writing this book where I talk about Yes, Thank You. And it got sent out to be reviewed. And it was my first book, so I was naive. I thought it was going to the New York Times. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was like going to be reviewed everywhere. And they sent out a galley, you know, an advanced copy of the book that was a, beyond a, a first draft. I mean, like an embarrassing, it had notes to myself in the book. Like I use the word flapjacks as a, a search word for a section that I have to go back to. So I'm telling some story about Ramdas and then just randomly it says flapjacks. Like, what is this book? And again, in my mind, the story I was building was some guy at the New York Times who was going to decide my fate as an author is reading this book. He's going to be like, it's good, except every once in a while there's a typo and there's weird sections that aren't finished and it says flapjacks for no reason. So I remember it doesn't make any sense to me now because I'm not there now. But at that moment, it was like a you know, black cloud, like I ate a black cloud and it just expanded inside of my body. You become heavy, you become dark, just like they do in the movies. It's like, ee, like sound kind of goes away. You can't, I could hear Val kind of trying to be like, relax, it's not a big deal. And there I was bemoaning this book that had this thing in it. And then I remembered what was in the book. And again, this is a thing I did not want to happen. And you say, yes, thank you. It's another version of 
if I feel this way the rest of my life. But what I like about it, and I only realized this recently, was its forgiveness, its mercy. It's, again, Richard Royce says, the first forgiveness is to reality itself. A lot of Christianity these days is like, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? It's actually something that we extend, and then it's it's sort almost like bounces back to us, but it starts with us. It's like, you forgive what's happening. You mm-hmm. start to see what's happening as an opportunity to forgive because you realize not to get too non-dual and weird, but you realize you're forgiving yourself. And that all of this guilt that you're carrying is actually because you keep projecting guilt onto everyone you see. This person's to this, this person's a jerk, this person's unworthy, this person should get out of my way, this person shouldn't have reclined their seat during the meal service. So you're going around judging people constantly. No wonder you're feeling blue. You're attacking everything. And, and really, what I think you're attacking your own guilt that you've pushed out into others. And that goes for random, seemingly random circumstances like this. So the yes is is uh, is a good start, but the thank you is really a good not untire. You're actually saying, no, this time I'm going to say Ramdas was right, Christ was right, Buddha was right. The way the obstacle is the way. Me being able to forgive this is the gift. My wife leaving me is the gift. Sometimes you can't do it in real time. I'm not saying I always can, but I'm getting better and better. Some humiliation, some embarrassment. It's this strange alchemy where you go like, oh, this was my chance. Another forgiveness, mercy, gratitude, opportunity. And that's the one, as someone who travels a lot, I know you do too, the delayed flight, whatever it might be, Yes, thank you, is the practice I want to leave. I'm going to have to listen to this again and again. I, uh, no, <laughs> oh, it's my. true, because it's, it's great. First of all, I told you before we started recording, I thought I was interviewing you. This is not false. I'm like, what? This is great. I, I'm so honored <laughs> and touched that you would interview me or ask me a question because I'm such an admirer of yours. Thank but for you. you to say that, I'm so glad. I mean... I've been excited to talk with you, so I'm glad. I'm I'm just so happy to see you, and thank you so much for sharing this time together. If you'd like to see Pete perform or learn more about his many fantastic projects, you can visit www.peteholmes.com or find him on social media at Pete Holmes. Hey folks, thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Sharon's many offerings, her new book, Real Life, or to get yourself a free guided meditation, you can visit SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease.